All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. All right. Uh, and good morning, everyone who's streaming online and can be with us this morning. So we are in uh, John chapter 19. Uh, so at first thought, when I looked through John 19, I was like, okay, we're going we're gonna, to like really be able to cover pretty much the whole chapter. But then the more I started going, there's just way too much. I mean, it's a huge thing, the crucifixion of Jesus, right, that takes place. So it's like one huge thing. But it's literally the biggest moment in all of history takes place in this one chapter. And so because it's the biggest moment in all of history, there's just so many things that are going on in this chapter. And there's so many so many things that Jesus is doing right here that I just couldn't fit it all into one. So we're going we're gonna to have to split it up. If we have time, we're going to watch a video at the end. And I think that uh, Jeff will be familiar with this video, just maybe. I, I know some of the others of you guys will be too. So all right, with that said, let's uh, start. We're going to open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that you truly are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and that you are uh, king not just in our lives, but you are sovereign and you are king over all people, all lands, all of creation and every nation. And so, Lord, this morning I pray that as we approach this passage that we would see truly that you are the only one who has full authority over all things, and that as we recognize that, that we would change our hearts and our lives to align with your kingship, Lord, and we just ask these things in your name, amen. All right, so last week, uh, Pilate questions Jesus, right, uh, but, but it ends up being, Jesus ends up actually interviewing Pilate, right, so the roles end up getting changed, interestingly enough, Jesus like, well, what do you think, right, so... Um, and so anyway, so we, we talked about this whole political thing that was going on, right? Pilate's not really this nice guy. You know, we, we kind of learned that last week. That's just so, oh, poor Pilate's just caught in a bad spot. No, he just wasn't a nice guy. All right, so he created a mess for himself. And so he'd already got the attention of the emperor. And so he was already treading on pretty thin ice as it was. Um, and so... He, he tries to placate the Jewish leaders by offering to release Jesus uh, in place of Barabbas. Well, the Jewish leaders, they are determined to have Jesus killed no matter what. So Pilate, he hasn't found any reason to put Jesus to death. He's, he can't find him guilty. All right. And so uh, he's trying to be political and, you know, try to find a way out of this mess by being political. Okay, we, we've seen in our culture how being political, co politically correct, uh, how well that works out for people, right? Not, not very well, all right? All right, so we're going to start reading in verse 1 in chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So flogging in Roman times was very brutal. Uh, so they would take a whip, but, you know, that whip, it just wasn't, that wasn't brutal enough. So they had to tie in, they would tie in shards of metal, glass, bone, anything that might inflict maximum damage to the person. Most people who were flogged, they never survived because of the horrific damage that it was inflicted upon the human body. And then the, the, the Romans, they would still take the dead body and they would crucify them anyway because they needed to make an example like, look, don't go against Rome. If, if you, you break our laws, this is what's going to happen to you. So they made examples of people. The Romans, uh, because they hated the Jews, because when the Romans would walk the streets, uh, Jewish rebels and the Jews, they would carry knives and they would run up behind or sneak up to the Roman soldiers and stab them and then run away and disappear into the crowd. So 
the Romans, when they had an opportunity to take their hatred of the Jewish people out on anyone, they took full advantage of it. And they were very brutal. They would cover the fa- they'd play a game. It was their game. They would cover the face of the prisoner, and they'd have about five of them would, would, would punch him, and then they'd take the, the, the hood off and then ask him, hey, so name the person who didn't punch you. And if you got it wrong, then they would do it all over again. So not only did they they beat him, Jesus, severely, but they also mocked him for the claim of being a king, and they mocked him by giving him a fake robe, crown, and scepter. The crown of thorns, it wasn't so much, their goal wasn't so much to inflict damage on him, although it did. Uh, It was meant to represent the rays of the crown pointing to heaven as if to falsely represent the status of a person as almost divine. Kind of like the Statue of Liberty, right? She has her crown, but it's pointing towards the sun or the sky. So this is Jesus' coronation as king. Completely different than what any king that we see or that we know. I didn't get a chance to watch King Charles' coronation. I I didn't get a chance to watch that this week. But I'm pretty sure his was nothing like this. Pretty sure it wasn't, right? But think about it. Everything that Jesus did as king was completely opposite of what we think a king should and would look like. I mean, think about it. His birth, right? He wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born in a nice, cozy, fancy bed or place. No, he was born in a barn with some animals, and his bed was a feeding trough. Stinky, smelly animals with some hay. That, the king, the king of kings and the lord of lords was born in a barn, in a feeding trough, like the lowest place that you, uh, you could be born, okay? Then we go back. If we look back at the pattern of Jewish kings, we're going to see some similarities, okay? And we see these in Jesus' life. So God called them, right? And by telling them, uh, by telling a prophet, hey, this is the guy. He's going to be king, right? I want you to go find this guy and go anoint him, okay? For example, God told Samuel where to go find Saul. Uh, We see the same thing that happened with David and Elijah. So there's a pattern going on here. So God himself spoke when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, saying he's the one. This, this is the one, okay? He's, he didn't come out and say he's the king, but he said he's the one. He's my son. Listen to him, okay? The son of the creator of the entire world. He's the one, the son of God the king of kings. So God didn't have to come out and say, okay, guys, this is, this is your guy, this is your king, make sure you crown him, give him a throne, you know, all this stuff, okay? In the mind of the Jew, beginning with Moses, the leadership of Israel was the king, the prophet, and the priest, okay? Originally, God was the king, all right? Moses was the prophet, and Aaron was the priest, and we see that all through history of this three-pronged leadership role, okay? So when people decided they no longer wanted God to be king, they wanted a human king instead, right? God gave them what he wanted. So Saul was the first king, but there was still this pattern of king, prophet, and priest, all right? So now here we are, but the beautiful thing is Jesus is all three. So Jesus is the king, Jesus is the prophet, and Jesus is the priest. He's all of those perfectly encompassed into one being. So, for example, with David, when he was anointed king, right, he didn't immediately go to the throne, right? So when Jesus was baptized, he didn't immediately say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm the king of kings, the Lord of lords. I'm going to set you free from this Roman occupation. I'm the Messiah. Well, that's why so many people had problems with him, because that's what they were expecting. They were expecting it to look just like the pattern of all the kings of Israel that they had before, okay? Well, the interesting, Jesus did follow that pattern, just not physically. Spiritually, he followed that pattern. So, for example, David, he was anointed king, but he didn't go right to the throne in the palace. No, what did he do? He went out and he protected his sheep. He killed the enemies of his sheep, such as the lions and the bears. So after Jesus' baptism, what did he do? 
he went out in the desert and began defeating our spiritual enemy. He went and defeated the devil in the desert by speaking the truth of God's word. He defeated him with truth. Then what happened after that? Immediately after that, he began his ministry of defeating our spiritual enemies by invading the kingdom of darkness, by healing, by casting out demons. Jesus proved that he had the power, the authority, and the capabilities to be king. I mean, that's what kings do, right? I mean, you look all through history. What do kings do? As soon as they, they become kings, they go out and they start defeating the enemies of their kingdom. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. But their, their thing is they were focused on a physical kingdom, not the spiritual kingdom of God. And Jesus more than proved his power and his authority as king of kings with his miracles, his power over uh, de demonic entities, evil spirits, and all of creation. Even the wind and the waves obeyed him. He had power over everything. So Jesus suffers this humiliation, this physical brutality. But even in this, Jesus is a picture of unshakable love. He is unshakable in his obedience to the Father, even as a king, as a king. The king of kings is still obedient to his Father. So even, you know, as you think about Pilate, these Roman guards, right, they had the truth standing right in front of them. They had to decide, what are they going to do with this king? What are they going to do this, with this truth? that they had learned. See, Jesus, Pilate has figured out that these bloodthirsty men, they're hoping that by the beating, they're going to bring him out. He's going to see, he's, he's no king, he's no threat to you. He has no power, no authority. Just let him go, let him go. Pilate can't find anything wrong with him. So why do all of these things to an innocent man, because he was afraid. He was afraid of losing his position and his power. So Pilate, right, he's looking, saying, behold the man. Look, he's, he, he, there's nothing he can do to you. Look at him. He, he's just weak. He's just a normal, average, every, everyday dude. Just, just let him go. Just let him go. But the religious leaders, they are insistent, Right? But they do have one moment of honesty here, right? It's not because Jesus is an insurrectionist. It's not because he's a threat to Caesar. They finally say, we have a law, and he claimed to be the son of God. And that's the truth. He did. He did claim to be the son of God, and that's the truth. Because that's what the truth that John's gospel is all about, is the truth about who Jesus Christ is. But it's interesting because Rome, they didn't care about religious matters. They didn't care about the Jews' laws and rules. But it's interesting because when they hear this, right, Pilate reacts in a very shocking way. John says he's even more afraid than ever, okay? A couple things. First of all, you got to think about Pilate. He was a pagan, okay? So he was probably very superstitious. He believed in all kinds of gods and deities and, you know, like, oh my gosh, you know, anything bad happens. Oh, one of the gods must hate me. I got to go make a sacrifice, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of their, their superstitious way of thinking. But the other gospel writers tell us that Pilate had a, a dream, which was a warning, and she had told Pilate, don't have anything to, you better not harm this man. Do not harm this man. And so I'm thinking he's like, uh-oh, wait a second. Uh, he's saying, they're saying he's the son of God. He just said his kingdom is not of this world. Oh, my goodness. What is going to happen to me, right? So Pilate goes back in again, and he wants to ask another question. So in verse 9, he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. 
So Pilate said, you will not speak to me. Do you not know I have the authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. The the, The person who delivered Jesus over were the religious leaders. Right? We like to think, well, it was, it was Judas. No, it was the religious leaders. Why were they more guilty? Because they had all the truth about God. They had all the truth. They had the whole scriptures. Pilate didn't have all that. So see, at some point, the reality is at some point, we all have to act on the truth that we have already been given about God. At some point, we have to. Pilate already had a one-on-one with Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. Jesus had given him the answer that he himself is the truth. And so if we don't act on the truth that we've been given already, we might not be given more. Jesus didn't give him more truth, except to say you don't have any authority if God didn't give it to you. But Pilate had to choose The Jewish leaders had to choose. They made their choice of how they were going to respond to the truth they'd been given. They rejected the truth. We don't know, right? We don't know how much, how gracious God's going to be with us as far as if we continue to reject the truth, reject the truth, reject the truth. When at some point, we don't know when that point is where God's going to say, okay, have it your way. You, you don't want the truth. You, you, you want to do life your way or you, your heart will not respond to the truth that you've been given. All right. God will not force his truth upon anyone. We all have a responsibility to act on the truth of the word of God that he has given us up to this point, Right. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out in verse 12, If you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. <clears throat> so when Pilate heard these words, right? So now Caesar's, but they, they bring Caesar into the equation, right? Like, hey, if you don't kill this guy, you're going to be in big trouble. You're going to be in big trouble. So Pilate heard these words. He brought Jesus out and sat on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate still, at the very end, he's still trying to get out of crucifying Jesus. The chief, this, this, is, this is the nail in their coffin. The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over to be crucified. See, Pilate and the religious leaders, they thought that they were sitting as judges of Jesus. But really, they were the ones being judged by God. They were the ones that were sitting in judgment based on their decision. So Pilate, he ended up being revealed as a judge who he wasn't impartial. He didn't really, he wasn't really truly interested in the truth at all. Um, He was about his own benefit and his political career. The Jewish leaders, as they rejected, crucify him, taking him away. We have no king but Caesar. That was their final rejection that got... The Son of God is not their king. Remember back in Israel's history? Do you remember way back, right? Uh, they, they had the option, right? When it was God was their king, okay? Moses was the prophet. Aaron was the high priest, right? And, you know, they get in the promised land, and then God gives them judges to rule over them. And then they decide, you know what? No, 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 we don't want God to be our king anymore. We want a human king like all these other people. So God said, okay, I'm going to give you what you asked for. You reject me as your king, I will give you the king that you want. Here he is. And they got Saul. 
And, and if you don't know how all that went down, go read your Old Testament and find out. See, we all have to decide with the truth that we have been given, who is our king? Who's our king? Who's the focus of our hearts? A lot of times, and in some cases, right, we, we want to be our own king. Right? You know, you're thinking about, how can I get attention? How can I get some focus? How can I get accolades? How can I get people to pay attention to me and follow me? And Right? I mean, we have to make sure that we're not serving in the name of, of Christ for our glory, but that we're serving in the name of Christ for his glory alone. It's his glory. See, you know that Christ is truly your king if you live out what you claim to be true about Christ as your king. See, Pilate didn't really believe that Jesus was the king of kings, the son of God, because if he believed it, he wouldn't have crucified him. You notice that the greatest rejection to the authority of Jesus Christ are the religious people. The people that had all of this. The people who had the greatest of all the truths. The greatest knowledge, the greatest truths. Those, those were the ones that had the biggest rejection to Jesus Christ as king. You know, when we go out and do saturate, those who are the greatest rejectors of us giving them the gift of Jesus are the religious people. In churches, those who, reje are the, those who reject the truth of Jesus being king of their life, the greatest rejectors is religious people in churches. So the final nail in the coffin, the religious say, we have no king but Jesus, no king but Caesar. So Pilate gives and he hands Jesus over to be crucified. And we see in another gospel that, Jesus, that Pilate, he washes his hands as if to say, he's not guilty. I'm washing my hands. See, I'm not guilty. But Pilate is guilty. Pilate's guilty. The religious are guilty. You are guilty. I'm guilty. Every single person in this passage except Jesus Christ is guilty. And he's the one that was sentenced to death. We're all guilty. And you know, a couple of things. I, I want us to, to grasp and comprehend that what Jesus did on this cross, what him going to this cross, it's not just about our salvation, Okay. And we're going to talk more about it next week. Jesus is literally reversing everything that has happened since the Garden of Eden. Okay? He's reversing all of it. He's reversing the pain, the sin. The, he's reversing. He's taking all the power back from. And it, this is a spiritual battle and war that has been going on since Genesis. This is, this is the big picture of what the cross is about, okay? Yeah, we, we're the beneficiaries of it, but it's just so much bigger than just, just us. And here's the thing. Jesus isn't asking, he doesn't want us to get sidetracked feeling sorry for what he endured, okay? He wants us to focus on what we believe, not what we feel. And believing is actually acting on the truth that we know about God. Acting on the truth about the fact and reality that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. We all have to choose who and what we will believe. We all have to choose which King are we going to follow. Who is our king? We can easily with our mouth say, oh, my king is Jesus. Yeah, my king. Because it's the right answer. But the reality is, do we live like we're kings? The king of our own kingdom that we're trying to build up and create? Right? And, you know, I think a lot of times, too, I mean, Pastor Terry's message about are we, are we truly saved? You need to check your salvation. I mean, 
I, this, the sad thing is, I, I think a lot of times people don't want to bow their knee to King Jesus because, especially religious people, because they're more concerned with what their friends are going to think of them and the people that they know in church are going to think of them. If they, if they get up from the feet of Jesus and then have to say, well, I wasn't really saved before this. And their pride won't let them do that. They're afraid to say, you know what? I really wasn't saved before. Jesus, the most righteous man on earth, he was the most righteous man on earth, but people preferred a criminal over him. He's the most just of all, but he didn't receive any justice. He's the most compassionate of all, but he received no compassion. He's the most caring of all. They didn't care about him. They didn't honor him. They didn't glorify him. So I'm in it a little bit early because I have a video that I want us to watch, and I'm actually shocked that I made it done in time for us to watch this video. Um, and it's about, about eight and a half minutes, so I want to make sure that we had time to watch it. Um, but I want, so what we covered today and what we're going to cover next week with the crucifixion, I want you guys to understand this goes way beyond. I mean, it's just so much bigger than just salvation. Okay. Jesus is creating a whole new humanity. It's like a reset button. The cross is Jesus, God hitting the reset button in human history, right? He's always had a remnant. He's always had his people, okay? But this is about spiritual warfare also. And Jesus wins. Spoiler alert, right? Okay. All right. Let's watch this video. vast expanse of a timeless place where silence ruled the outer space. Ominously towering it stood, the symbol of a spirit war between the one named Lucifer and the morning star, the ultimate of good. Enveloped by a trillion planets, clean as lightning and hard as granite. A cosmic coliseum would host the end of the war between the Lord of sin and death and the omnipotent creator of man's first breath who will decide who forever will be the champion. Followed by their trophies, dead and gone. 
Hitler, Napoleon, Pharaoh come home, tormented and vexed and grieved, waiting for their judgment from the throne. Then a chill swept through the mammoth crowd, and the demons squealed with glee as a sordid, vulgar, repulsive message was felt. Arrogantly prancing hands held high, draped in a sparkling shroud, trolled by demons, Satan ascended from hell. Then Satan cringed, the sinners groaned, the demons reeled in pain, as a swell of power like silent thunder rolled. With a surge of light beyond intense, illuminating the universe in resplendent glory, appeared the Son of God. Then a persona, yes, extraordinaire, appeared in center ring. God the Father will oversee the doom. Opening the book of life, each grandstand hushed in awe, as majestically he said, now here's the rules. He'll be wounded for their transgressions, bruised for iniquities. When he said by his stripes they're healed, the devil shook. He screams, sickness is my specialty. I hate that healing junk. God said, you shut your face, I wrote the book. Then the father looked at his only son and said, You know the rules. Your blood will cleanse their sin and calm their fears. Then he pointed his finger at Satan and said, And I know you know the rules. You've been twisting them to deceive my people for years. Satan cried, I'll kill you, Christ. You will never be this friend. The demons wheezed. Yes. Satan jeered, You're dead, me, Jesus. I'm gonna bless you up today. Jesus said, Go ahead, make my day. The bell, the crowd, the fight was on, and the devil leaped in fury. With all his evil tricks, he came undone. He threw his jabs of hate and lust, a stab of pride and envy. But the hands that knew no sin blocked everyone. Forty days and nights they fought, and Satan couldn't touch him. Now the final blow saved for the final round. Prophetically, Christ's hands came down and Satan struck in vengeance. The blow of death fell Jesus to the ground. The devils roared in victory. The saints shocked and perplexed as wounds appeared upon his hands and feet. Then Satan kicked him in his side and blood and water flowed. And they waited for the ten count of defeat. God the Father turned his head, his tears announcing Christ was dead. The ten count would proclaim the battle's end. Then Satan trembled through his sweat in unexpected horror. Yet, as God started to count, by saying, ten. Hey, hey wait a minute, God. Nine. You are counting wrong. Eight. His eyes are shut. Seven. His fingers are twitching. Six. Where's all this light coming from? Five. He's alive. Four.
I know some of you guys already know that song, but I couldn't help but um, <clears throat> as we're going through this passage, that this was really a spiritual battle that was going on. Um, so it was much more beyond our salvation. Oh, I guess I left off. We're going to cover 17 next week. So when you see that we're going through verse 17, just know that's next week. Sorry, Caitlin, I messed that up. So anyway, so it's, that's the truth. Not only Jesus is a champion over the powers of darkness, but he's the king. He's the only king king, the one and only king, we all have to decide what do we believe, what will we live out regarding King Jesus? Will we live as if he's our king, or are we going to live our lives and act as if we're our own king, building our own kingdom? Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you so much for your power, your authority, your kingdom, your glory, your sovereignty, that you have defeated our enemies, our spiritual enemies, so that we can have new life with you, that we can be, have a restored relationship with you. Not just restore, but better than, than what it ever was before. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would be humbled and awed over what you've truly done for us at the cross, Lord, that we would not just breeze through the, the crucifixion and we not just breeze through this chapter and just out of familiarity, but that we would truly allow the, the realities of who you are and what you've done, allow it to soak and penetrate deep into the, our hearts so that we are transformed by the truth of your sovereignty and your kingship and your kingdom. And so, Lord, I pray for the rest of our time together in worship and as we hear the word, Lord, that we would be attuned and attentive to honor and glorify you as king and give you the glory and honor that is befitting of you. And we just ask these things in your name. Amen.